All right, hello, and welcome to today's video where we're going to be talking about why we are not machines and why learning to understand that our energy and our capacity and our ability is always going to fluctuate. So long as we are alive, so long as we are human, that all of these things are going to change and they are going to ebb and they are going to flow and that we are never going to become completely consistent human beings who are fully predictable in the ways that we are and who never have down times or times when things that we used to be able to handle we can't handle anymore or changes in our capacity and in our energy and all of these things. And why learning to honor and validate this is a huge part, again, of finding self-love and finding a way of living life that actually works for us as individuals and why doing so is also going to help us create a better humanity for all of us. Because living like we are machines is something that I feel like is so baked into our culture at this point that we're not even seeing all the ways in which it is impacting us and affecting us and all the ways in which we're doing it um, in all these different areas of our lives. So like a lot of us kind of in the spirituality, personal growth, all of this stuff, we're starting to get awareness around the idea that like we're overproducing and that in our work and in our output that we are expected to be in this state of constant productivity and we're starting to realize that we need to rest and we need to pull back and all of these things. And that's great. And we're going to talk about that today, um, definitely. But then on top of that, I think that there's even more to this story and more to this idea that we are acting like machines in our relationships, in how we handle our emotions, in how we handle our bodies and our health, and how, again, it's just kind of seeped into every area of our lives like how we literally treat one another as human beings that we need to take like the whole broad look at this phenomenon of acting like we're machines and how it's so harmful and where it's showing up everywhere in our lives and how we can start to change that and reconnect with our humanity so that we're not living like that and so that we can, again, create a better world. We can create a world where there's more compassion, where there's more understanding, where our systems are designed around our humanity versus our humanity trying to design ourselves around these impossible systems. Okay, so again, uh, before we get started, I have <laughs> lots of other content. If this is resonating with you, I highly recommend that you check out my website, PerceptionTrainers.com. I have lots of blogs on there. I have endless YouTube videos on my YouTube channel, uh, Perception Trainers YouTube. Um, you can check out my Instagram. I have daily content on there. I have my mystery school if you want to go deeper. I, it's a five-year self-study program and there's five courses included and it's all for the same price. You don't have to upgrade or level up for anything and it comes with a really beautiful community and we've been connecting a lot in there lately. And then I also do one-on-one -on -one coaching so you can find all of those links in my link tree or on my website and my bio, uh, wherever you're watching this. So just letting you know all about that. Um, if this work is resonating with you, I would love to work with you deeper or hope that you find more of my free content uh, helpful. So just putting that out there, um, there's lots of help where this came from. All right, so we live in a culture right now where I think it's pretty easy to say that we are expected to act like machines, especially when it comes to our productivity and to work. All right, so we are seeing more and more and more that people are promoting this idea of, you know, and, and this is kind of how it's always been. This is how it's been forever, and it's just even more prevalent now in the internet age and with the age of technology and all the ways that we can communicate with each other now. But these kind of like get rich quick schemes and get out of the system and get out of the matrix and start your own company and be your own boss and 
MLMs and all of these things that promise to take us out of that nine to five grind and into some sort of time freedom, money freedom that takes us out of the system, right? And if you're watching the spiritual community, they'll make it spiritual, right? Like you need to find your purpose and then you'll vibrate out of the matrix. And if you're a boss babe, it's the find your worth, find your value, and then charge what you're worth and what your value is, and you'll never work a day in your life. There's all sorts of different flavors of the get out of the matrix, get out of the nine to five, and make money quickly or make money easily doing something that you love, and all of these messages. And and again, I think overall, of course, it's it's beneficial and it's lovely if we can find some form of vocation that we enjoy doing and i'm never going to discourage anyone from looking for that like to to have something that you do be your passion is beautiful and lovely and wonderful and if that is something that is possible for you if you have a passion that can be monetized in our culture and that you can do it in a way where you don't have to kill yourself i as in like work really, really hard and and kind of get to a point where you're selling what you're selling in a way that makes it feel inauthentic to you or that doesn't feel good to you. If you can do it in some way that is sustainable for you, that's lovely and that's awesome and I want that for you. And we need to acknowledge and we need to validate that number one, not everybody has a passion. Not everybody has a passion that can be monetized. Not everybody has a passion that is going to be celebrated by our culture. And we also have to acknowledge that there are many, many jobs that need to get done in order for our society to run properly, in order for our society to function, that probably aren't going to be anybody's passion. Yes? That we need people to bag and shelve our groceries. We need people to maintain our public spaces. We need nurses. We need teachers. We need people who are doing labor, laborious jobs, laborious jobs, people who are doing things that are likely not going to be their highest excitement in life. And along with that, we also have to understand that in our culture today and in our world today, when you turn your passion into a career, a lot of the time, it's going to take the passion out of it. A lot of the time, it's going to radically change the way that you interact with this thing that you do because the second you make it something that has to support you, the second you make it something that is going to be a part of your income, it totally changes your dynamic and your relationship with the thing that you're doing. It's no longer art for the sake of art. It's no longer self-expression for the sake of self-expression. It's no longer an offering that's just coming from the goodness of your heart because it now has to fit into a system, into a monetary system, into a system of supply and demand that is going to ask us to to do things that we're likely not going to be passionate about. It's going to ask us to compromise our expression in some way to make it palatable to a larger audience. It's going to ask us to have to engage in our passion even when we're not feeling it, even when we're not passionate about it in that moment or in that day. So when we look at it in a broader context, even if we said like everyone should work a job that's their passion, we need to understand that that's not practical in real society. That not everyone has a passion, period, right? Like I I understand that we kind of live in a world right now where we are being told over and over and over again that if you find your purpose, there's going to be some sort of monetary value in that. And that it can be something that fits into our market economy. And this is just not reality. Some people 
are going to just love playing video games. <laughs> Some people are going to love going out in nature and hiking. Some people are going to love reading books and their passion, their thing that they're passionate about. Some people aren't even going to have a singular thing that is their passion. Lots of people have just general interests and they enjoy their lives generally and there isn't one thing that is the thing that keeps them up at night or the thing that motivates them to get out of bed in the morning. This just isn't a reality. So not everybody has a passion. And not everybody has a passion that can be monetized into something. Not everybody has a passion that can be monetized into something. If you love being a mother, you shouldn't be trying to monetize that, right? That doesn't mean make yourself a mommy blogger. That doesn't mean put all your kids out on social media. <laughs> that doesn't mean become a foster parent. That doesn't mean, that just means that's what you love doing. And, and there isn't going to be a monetary value for that. In our culture, especially the way that our culture is set up. Like personally, if you ask me, I think there should be, I think that there should be programs to support people who are raising children and that help with all the costs of that, but that's a different talk for a different day. My point being that this idea that we can all have a passion that is then monetizable is not reality. Okay? So that's part of stepping out of living like we are machines. That we are here to just turn something about ourselves about our passion, about what we love, into something we can offer to the system. Not all of us have that. Second thing, again, just because you have a passion doesn't mean you should monetize it. Does not mean you should feed it to the system. If you're an artist, if you love baking, if you love Whatever it is, you have a passion for something, reading books, and you know you have a passion, that still doesn't mean that you should turn around and try to figure out how to make that your job. Because number one, again, culture might not value it. There is no guarantee that says just because you found your passion and you're really good at your passion, that our culture is going to say, yes, that's monetarily valuable, and it's going to be monetarily valuable enough to cover your expenses every month. There's no rule that says that. There's no universal rule that says that. We know f full well that there are incredibly talented artists out there, musicians, people who have a passion, who are never going to be mainstream, who are never going to be able to make enough money doing the thing that they love, no matter how much they sell it, no matter how much they market it, no matter how much gloss and glitter they put over it, it's just not going to be popular. Our culture does not just value something because it's someone's passion. Our culture has a very specific set of values, a very specific kind of category of things that we will buy and honestly, right, at this point, we're living in a reality where let's just be very, very clear. If you're pretty, if you're hot, and you look young, and you tell people to buy something, they're probably going to buy it. Right? Like, this is the culture we're living in. How you look determines how successful you're going to be at selling a thing. And the things that people buy, generally speaking, are not the most deep, passion-filled, expressive art, right? Like we're buying skincare and we're buying clothes and we're buying entertainment because we're all overwhelmed and we all want to stay pretty and we all want to stay young. Like we have to take a step back and recognize the actual culture that we're living in. And when you try to turn your passion into something that people are going to buy, that's the condition we're stepping into. 
We're not walking into a world where we value depth, where we value, like where large numbers of people value nuance and context and, and things that are, you know, birthed from someone's soul. Like that, this just isn't the reality of what we're living in. Most of us are surrounded by people who have very superficial interests because we're all overwhelmed, we're all stressed, we're all living in this world where we're disconnected from our bodies and we're disconnected from our emotions and we're disconnected from one another and what we value is entertainment and distraction and quick fixes and simple solutions and things that seem like they're going to change our lives overnight and all of that stuff. So again, just because you have a passion and just because you're really good at something does not mean our culture is going to reward you with a paycheck. And then like I already said, there are many, many, many jobs out there that I don't think anyone is going to say, you know, like it is my passion to be a janitor. Maybe it is, and I'm not shaming that. If that's something that you absolutely love doing, great. But... uh, Right? Most people aren't going to be like, I am so passionate about getting up in the morning and going and begging people's groceries, especially day in, day out, working that job full time. But that doesn't mean that we don't need people doing those jobs and that those jobs aren't incredibly valuable to society. Right? We need people doing that labor. We are always going to need people doing that labor. And that means we're going to need people working jobs that aren't their passion. And then, like I said again, in order to make your passion something that is marketable, it's so hard. (laughs) Like, it is really, really difficult and challenging. And it almost requires, and I'm just speaking from personal experience here and from listening to the other people who I know like run their own companies and do their own stuff. Like it is hard. It's hard to not compromise your values. It's hard to not get, you know, that affiliate code and those affiliate links and partner with brands because that's how you get things. It's hard to not say, okay, if I'm going to put myself out there, I have to look a certain way and I have to present a certain way and I have to be a certain way because that's what sells things. Turning your passion into a stream of income that's consistent is so hard. It is not a release from the grind of the nine to five. Usually it's I quit my nine to five so I can do a 24 seven. Because that's kind of what it takes most of the time. And then it requires that you compromise in certain ways and you do things that you don't want to do and all of this stuff. So putting that all into context, the answer to this feeling that the 9 to 5 way of working sucks is not necessarily going to be finding your passion and turning it into a job. Because it's the system, it's the foundation that we're working with that's actually the problem. The reason that working nine to fives is so shitty for most people is not because working a nine to five is inherently shitty or because it's not their passion. It's because we don't have fair pay for fair work. We don't have paid vacations. We don't have health care. We don't have bonuses. We don't have, you know, reasonable time off. We don't have child care. We don't have all of these things that in a society where we are thinking, how do we support humanity? A humanity that are not machines. All of these things that should be part and parcel of what it means to work. Right? It should be, logically, that you put in a day's work 
so that you can have a reasonable quality of life. That that's the exchange. That we offer something that society needs. We offer our service. And in exchange for that, we have a reasonable quality of life. We have a reasonable level of safety. We have a reasonable level of being able to have access to the things that we need, food, shelter, clothing, rest, enough time to spend time with our families, to spend time with our friends, to do things we enjoy, to have health care, right? To not feel like the, the floor is going to fall out from under us if something unexpected happens. That is what is making working in the matrix so awful is that people are being treated like we are machines and we are expected to behave like machines where we are fully independent where employers take as much as they can and give as little as they can where we still as a culture agree that low skilled labor equals you are going to put in a day's work and not get a quality of life out of that. That it's fair for corporations to be paying their shareholders and their CEOs millions and billions of dollars a year while their employees literally can't afford food. That's what's fucked up. That's where this mindset that we are machines and should just be constantly in a state of production and if we're not producing in a way that's valued by society in the values that society has right now which are very superficial and kind of shitty that you don't deserve to have what you need to survive let alone to thrive that's what's fucked up you see so this is, and then we feel guilty, exactly. Because then, right, it's completely always, the mindset is turned around. That if you're not earning enough, if you're not making ends meet, if you don't have high level income, that, that is a reflection on your worth and your value. That is total BS. That is the matrix. That is the mindset that is, that is destroying us. This idea that if our market economy undervalues you, that that is a flaw in you. It's like, no, we do not live in a system where everyone has access to being able to work a high level job. And again, we don't live in a system that would even be able to support that. We don't live in a system where everyone can be a millionaire. We don't live in a system where everyone has access to the resources, the education, the connections that you need to get to a high level job. We can't all just pull ourselves up by our bootstraps. Some of us are chronically ill. Some of us are neurodiverse. Some of us come from backgrounds where we literally had a shitty education, where we are judged by society, by how we look, and we are literally discriminated against in terms of getting hired based on that. There are so many cultural factors that go into your level of income that have nothing to do with the choices you make and have nothing to do with you as a human being. But we, as a culture, judge each other like machines. Do you fit the role? Are you beautiful? Are you, do you fit into this box? Have you been educated in this way? Is this your pedigree? Is this your background? And if not, you're not valuable. That's completely backwards. That's not reality. That is us treating each other like machines. So then there are people out there
who genuinely have to push themselves every single day past what is healthy for them, past what is actually good for their bodies and their minds and their nervous systems in order to make ends meet or to not even make ends meet. Right? We live in a culture where some people literally have to push past what is reasonable for a human being to do just to have, maintain, or to barely even have a quality of life. And that is a flaw in the system. And then there are others of us who objectively have enough and could be okay, but because of how our culture is constantly indoctrinating us into the idea that your value and your worth comes from how much money you make and comes from what you do, and there's never enough, it can never be enough, that we go overboard, we continually are in this state of like, oh my god, I need to be producing, I need to be doing things. I need to be going for more, I need to have more, I need to do more, I need to be more. Because culture is constantly shoving that message down our throats. Okay, so I work a high level job as an attorney and still some people make more money. So being a machine doesn't guarantee anything anyway. So it's very true that it's a fallacy. Exactly. There are people who work high level jobs. There are people who work low level jobs. Who will never be millionaires. Or even, like I say, for some people, will never even earn a basic quality of life. And that's because our systems are treating us like machines. And on top of this, we live in a culture that is so incredibly hyper-individualistic that has us fully seeing one another as competition for resources, as competition, where we are trained over and over and over again not to have compassion for each other, not to have compassion for ourselves, not to see one another as fellow humans, but to see each other as a political adversary, as different than me because you have a different religion than me, as different than me because you identify sexually differently than I do. There are all these culture wars and ways that we are pitted against one another. And the whole concept of the nuclear family, that we're just supposed to rely on a mom and a dad and the kids, and that that's what community is. And that you just go to work and you come home and you have your spouse and you have your kids and that's what a good life is and that's what you're supposed to do. That again is robbing us so much of what it takes to make us feel safe as a human being. We have evolved for almost our entire humanity. If we look at the timeline of humans being humans and being alive on this planet, if this is how long we've been humans, this is how long we haven't lived in community. This is how long we've depended on the nuclear family, we've been isolated, We've been trained to see literally everyone who's even slightly different from us as competition where we don't have extended family living with us or close to us, where we don't have literally you have a baby and the whole village helps you raise that child. We are not adapted to the way that we are living now. It's incredibly harmful. And again, it's robbing us of our humanity to a degree that's causing us to feel so unsafe, to feel so dysregulated all the time. 
And then we're told that the answer is work more, be more productive, consume more things, become more beautiful, become more successful, become more societally acceptable. Burn yourself out. Every single time you don't feel safe, every single time you feel not great about your life, it's a lack of productivity or a lack of consumption. We're being completely distracted from what it means to be human, which is to be connected to a community, to have access to nature, to have access to activities that we can do that we don't have to monetize, that are just for pleasure and enjoyment, to have access to work that's functional, that we can like see the outcome of what we're doing and why it's beneficial, and then receive sustenance in return. That's what makes a human being feel good and feel regulated and feel sane. But we don't have really any of that in our culture. So much of our culture is just about getting up, going to work, coming home, watching TV, eating food, on repeat. And then on the weekend you do chores. And maybe you have friends and maybe you see them on the weekends or... But you're supposed to have a single significant other that is your source of everything. And then the two of you are supposed to raise children on your own. And that that's what success is. That, at its core, is treating us like machines. Because that is not how humans have evolved to thrive for literally hundreds of thousands of years. And then like I said, right, we then have the whole spirituality, self-help, personal growth world telling us if you have anxiety, if you have depression, if you don't love your job, if you feel lonely, if you don't feel satisfied in your relationships, if you aren't happy in your body, all of these things, that the root cause is you aren't producing or consuming the right things. You're not thinking the right things. There's something broken about you. You're not manifesting right. You need to find your passion so you can turn it into a career. They keep selling us more of the problem, telling us that this is what the solution is going to be. The solution to our problems is not more consumption and production. It's not more isolation and hyper-individualism. And then even deeper than that, even deeper than that, in our relationships, we're literally being told more and more these days that to be healthy, is to like fully take care of yourself. To essentially have no needs in your relationship. To be fully self-aware and fully self-actualized so that you never need your partner or friends or multiple partners or family members to help you out when you're feeling down. To reassure you on those days when you are having a hard time reassuring yourself. We have been conditioned to see any level of relational vulnerability as a weakness, as doing something wrong, as immaturity, as being not spiritual, as not taking responsibility for yourself. That we're supposed to be so hyper-independent that we never need co-regulation 
or just someone to be there when we are experiencing something hard or someone to help us work through our emotions. Like it is mind blowing to me how much in my one-on-one sessions I am the first person that so many of my clients have ever had in their life to just make it safe for them to fall apart and to hold space for them and to be there for them and then to help them figure out their steps on the other side of their emotional expression. To just validate their emotions first, to make room for the expression, to not freak out, to know that we need to vent and be upset and cry and get angry sometimes and that we'll find our power eventually, we'll find our steps eventually But a lot of the time, we just need a safe space to just be a human. It blows my mind how many people have never experienced that before. That we are so afraid of our own emotions and of others' emotions. Because again, what do those emotions do? They take us out of being constantly productive and constantly doing things. We're trained to avoid our emotions through working or through consuming things. We've never been taught how to just feel an emotion, how to express it, how to hold someone else through their emotion to help people figure out what they're actually feeling and then what they need based on those feelings. All of these things have been so demonized as though they are not part of what it is to be human and especially in the spirituality and the self-help world, which is, just to let you know, a business that is operating, generally speaking, from the exact same mentality as what we would label secular. That you're supposed to be completely independent and capable of consuming and producing at higher and higher rates at all times. That you never need anyone, you never need anything, and that nothing ever gets in the way of your productivity and your consumption. Spirituality is doing the exact same thing to us. Oh, you still have negative emotions? You still get triggered? You still need someone in your life to be there for you? You're broken. Buy my course. And I'll teach you how to never feel that way again. I'll teach you how to empower yourself. I'll teach you how to manifest so that you never feel bad again. No, that's not reality. Right? The mystery school is 100%. You are going to have negative emotions for the rest of your life. You are going to go through periods of time where life pulls the rug out from under you and you have no fucking idea what to go what to do. You are going to go through periods of times where you get triggered. And this is what it means to be alive. So how do we get tools to work through those things when they inevitably happen? Right? I'm not promising transcendence from being a human. I'm saying we can learn how to be okay with being a human. And then we can get tools for working through the hard things that happen when we're humans. Because you're not broken and there's nothing wrong with you. You're a human with needs and you're allowed to have them and you're never going to get rid of them. And that's what it means to validate our humanity and not treat ourselves like machines. You are not just here to consume and produce and be as independent as possible. But that is basically what all of self-help, spirituality, personal growth, the matrix, mainstream is telling you you are supposed to be and do. And also you're never supposed to age and you're supposed to be beautiful and you're supposed to be straight Cis, het, normative in every way. 
and that that's what makes you a high level person. Right? We are being treated like machines in every area of our life. We are being separated from our humanity. The fact that we can go out and just watch, like, right, when you, when I go out and I just watch how people interact, it's less so over here where I live now, but especially in Western cultures. There's this, like, massive disconnect. Like, I remember walking around grocery stores in the West, and people would literally bump into me, like, physically hit their body against my body, and, like, not register it. People literally walk around, glazed over, completely, not, like, not even necessarily in their phones or on technology. They're like not present. We're not interacting with each other. We're rude to customer service agents. We're in traffic honking at one another and just, there's no patience. There's no compassion. Like it makes me sad that when I go up and pay for an item at the till and just ask the person how their day is going. They like light up and that's like the first time that's happened to them today. That's sad. That's not how it should be. Like we're so disconnected from one another. We're so disconnected from seeing that we are a culture that rely on one another. That we don't even see the value in the human being that's in front of us. And what's more than that, like we don't see the value in the human beings that we are. Right? Most of us are walking around with shame and guilt. These messages that we are not enough, we are not good enough, that our pain is all of our fault, if we have physical illness, it's our fault. If we're not beautiful, it's our fault. If we have mental health issues, it's our fault. If we're not earning enough money to be safe, it's our fault. That we are less than, we are not worthy, we are not good enough. Instead of, what's actually happening? What's the system we're living in? What have you faced in your life? that has been traumatizing? What are your mindsets? What are the things that are going on in your body that have nothing to do with you and the choices that you've made? We don't walk around with compassion for each other and compassion for the people who are struggling because again, that would mean we would have to challenge the system. So long as we're feeling bad about ourselves, so long as we're making it our fault and everyone else's fault, that if you're suffering, it's your fault, we don't step back and say, okay, what might actually be causing this suffering if it's not just everyone's individual choices? That is the one cause of everything that happens in their life. Right? Like, I have had chronic illness my entire life. And for my entire life, I've been blamed for it. I was born with part of my intestine shoved between two arteries. And it totally fucked up <laughs> everything in my digestive system. And now I have crazy allergies and my health was like, and is still a huge complicated mess. And for as long as I've been on the internet, people have been like, you're anorexic, you're just doing this, you're doing that. They're just assuming that I did it to myself and it's my fault and if I'm not healed, it's because I'm not doing the right things. There's like no compassion and I'm not the only one. 
Like literally everybody that I know who's on the internet has someone saying, if you've got any kind of perceived vulnerability, that you're doing something wrong. You should be ashamed of yourself. <laughs> this is all how we live in a culture that has taught us to be machines. The system is perfect. It's working perfectly. If it's not benefiting you, you are the one who's failing. And you can buy and you can work your way out of it. That's the underlying message of our culture that treats us like machines. So again, what's the solution? Well, number one, we work on the inner value thing. We have to start to deconstruct these stories. Everywhere where we feel shame, blame, and guilt about who and what we are and how we're behaving and how we're responding, that's our entry point into deconstructing these toxic messages that have nothing to do with reality. Right? If you work one-on-one -on -one with me, or if you're in the mystery school, or most of my videos, all of my content, it's about deconstructing these ideas that you're suffering because you are shitty, that you deserve it, that you're broken, that there's something wrong with you. That's the main foundation we need to move past. 100% of the time, every client I've ever worked with, every person I've ever seen go through the mystery school, when we question these shame and these guilt stories, we are going to start to deconstruct these toxic messages from society. And in so doing, we are going to start to realize and recognize the things that we've been through that have led to where we are right now that had nothing to do with what we chose, that are going to lead to us connecting to our true emotions, our anger, our sadness, our resentment, and leading us to figuring out how to express these things, how to embody them, how to move through them, so that we can then get the messages from them. What made us so upset? What hurt about what we went through? What didn't work? What is it that we've been culturally indoctrinated is the way things should be and you need to feel like shit about yourself if you can't fit into it? To wait, why is it this way? Who benefits from it being this way? Why should I believe that I'm broken if I can't fit into that? We start with this internal deconstruction, this internal starting to understand who we really are and what we really need and what it means to do enough, what it means to have real connection, what it means to have real connection to our emotions and our bodies. And that then is going to lead to us being the kind of people who can actively start to deconstruct what's toxic about our culture because the more you start to see it in yourself how you have been indoctrinated how you have been trained to see things in a way that they are not and the less you are feeling shame blame and guilt the more you're going to see whoa okay no it's all of these things that don't work and then it's a process of just taking steps from there to support yourself the best you can because of course right not all of us are going to be able or especially not right away to make things perfect for ourselves we're not going to just step out of a relationship into like a perfectly aligned one we're not going to just figure out how to live a perfect life where we're making enough money and we feel safe and all these things it's going to be a transition there are going to be many many phases and many many steps and figuring those things out is hard and it's complicated but again, 
we can learn tools for doing that. And those tools are all going to be centered around our humanity, our emotions, our feelings, our bodies, our rhythms, what's actually helpful and beneficial, and what's just stimulation or distraction or more of the system. But again, this is why I say that the self-love path is the start. It's the foundation for everything else. Because so long as we're continuing to live in shame, blame, and guilt, we're not seeing reality. We are treating ourselves like machines and we are being treated like machines. And that is why we are suffering. Okay? So do I have any questions, comments, concerns before I wrap up here? Everywhere where you feel shame and guilt, that's your entry point into seeing where you have been indoctrinated to see reality in a way that it is not. That's culture, that's not reality. So I really want you to ask yourself, where did those shame, blame, and guilt stories come from? Why do you feel shame, blame, and guilt? And then what if you were to consider, what if I don't have to feel shitty about this? What if not making as much money as other people doesn't have to mean I am a piece of shit? What if not looking how I'm supposed to look in society doesn't mean I'm not worthy. What if not having a partner doesn't mean I'm not valuable and I'm not lovable and I'm not worthy? Like really ask yourself these things. What if I could feel lovable, worthy and valuable even if none of these things changed? How would that change my perception of myself? How would that change my perception of reality? And then really starting to challenge ourselves with where we are doing too much, with where we are asking too much of ourselves, where we are trying to be too independent where we are working to a point of burnout and hurting ourselves that is not necessary. And how can we start to pull back on that? How can we start to find our enough and, and accept that culture might think we're not doing enough? Okay, so do you think that if we accept the idea of our true worth could make most people reject us. It's a fear of mine. How do you deal with that extreme fear? Okay. To an extent, we probably will get rejected. When we are not striving to constantly be what everyone around us wants us to be and to live up to all of these expectations, some people are going to judge us. Some people are going to reject us. Some people are going to literally say, you're not good enough. And that's why, again, the self-love path is a huge, a huge part of the self-love path is about learning to develop your own inner sense of love and being there for yourself and seeing that you can be rejected and still be okay. And it comes down to learning to be our own parent and learning to be our own safe place where we're not constantly in a state of outward projection, right? Looking for, for love and security and safety outside at all times because we have absolutely no inner resource. And that is something that, especially if we never had a secure connection growing up, can be very, very difficult to develop. So I am not saying that this is easy, 
And when we have that extreme fear of being rejected, that means that we don't have an inner resource. And that takes time to develop. We have to learn to be kind to ourselves. We have to learn to look for how we can be resourceful and how we can show up for ourselves and be on our own side and really like prove to ourselves that our own presence and our own love does mean something before we're going to believe it. It takes consistent effort of learning to watch yourself, beat yourself up, and be your own worst enemy. And changing those narratives so that the person you are alone with when you are alone with you is someone that you is nice to you. Right? Like, this is why this self-love work is so important. Because, again, if we are still, if we live in a world, if we live in a way where we are so afraid of disappointing other people, we're never going to find our enough. We're never going to find peace. We're never going to find a way out of the toxic conditioning. Because part of getting out of the toxic conditioning is doing things that other people are not going to accept. Right? Like, that's just kind of the bottom line of it. I have been heavily rejected for a lot of the choices that I made that were very much the choices I needed to make and that were the right choice and the most supportive choice for me. And they did lead to rejection. And it did lead to people misunderstanding me. And it did lead to me having to become my own resource. And that's a shame and that's not how it should be. But that is the reality of the world we live in. And then you will also see that not everyone rejects you. It's not going to be everyone. You might get rejected by some people, but it won't be everyone. So how do we learn to be okay with, I am going to get rejected? Some people aren't going to like it. That's the reality that we have to face. And so how can you start to be nice to yourself and be on your own side and be your own resource enough that you can see that you can be okay even if that happens? And then how can you start to look for the people that still do love you and support you even when you're doing what's right for you and what other people might reject? Okay, so both of these things. Does that answer your question? And, I, and again, it's, it's a journey. There's no quick fix for that. That's part of why the reason, like part of why the Mystery School is so long, why I have been able to continue to put out content for the last 10 years and I'm still doing it. Because it just takes a lot of repetition and a lot of time and a lot of practice. It's not quick, it's not easy, it's not flashy. I can't give you a 30 day program. It just takes practice and it takes deconstructing and it takes facing the fears and doing it anyway and seeing that we're okay and learning how to regulate and learning how to be in real reality so that when our catastrophizing mind comes up and says, you just got rejected, you're going to die, you can be like, actually, I got rejected and it's okay. Like, yeah, I got rejected. My worst fear came true and... I still have a roof over my head. I still have other people who love me. I still have me. I can be on my own side. I didn't lose everything. I'm going to be okay. Right? It's a process. That's what reconnecting to our humanity is all about. So, you are not a machine. Your worth and your value is not based on how much you can consume and produce. And consumption and production are not the answer to all of our problems. So I hope that this was seed planting and illuminating and that it inspires you to go on a journey to take steps, one step at a time, to deconstruct all of this. Okay? Okay. So thank you for being here. Thank you for listening. 
You're awesome. You deserve love. Just how you are. Let's build a new society together through starting with compassion and curiosity for ourselves so that we can then create a society based on compassion and curiosity instead of competition and consumerism. Right? Okay. Thank you for being here. Have a great week. I'll see you when I see you.